right, this morning, <clears throat> um, part four of being a healthy man. <clears throat> and I had planned on finishing this series two weeks ago. Um, but I stumbled onto something that I thought you might feel is worth pursuing. And I'm not sure how many of you remember this. But we talked about this a number of years ago. But I'm going in a different direction, so I'm not repeating what we did a number of years ago. <clears throat> but we looked, I don't know if you remember, for you who might have been here, we looked at sins that we as, as men have a hard time detecting in our lives. You see, we can see these sins in other people. We just have a hard time seeing them in our lives. I mean, if you think about it, if, if a man cheats on his wife or lies or steals, usually they're aware of it. They might, you know, not have a, feel a lot of compunction over it, but, you know, they, they realize that they've done something wrong. Now, if you ever get to a point where you steal or you lie and it doesn't bother you, your, your, your conscience is kind of dead. <clears throat> but there are a number of sins, three in particular, that... When we commit them, we have a hard time recognizing them and seeing them, and that's what makes them so deadly. Now, question. Do you remember any of those three sins that I'm referring to? Pride. <clears throat> huh? Pride. Pride is one. Greed. Greed is two. Envy. Envy is three. Boy, you guys are sharp. Other groups, they, they struggle with it. They, didn't, they, they, didn't, they weren't near that good, so we got to see. Good group this morning. Um, but yeah, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says the problem with pride is that you see it in other people, you just don't see it in yourselves. And pride, as he says, is compare, you're comparing and, and, and seeking to be superior to others. And it can be on a moral issue, it can be on uh, intelligence issue, it can be on a performance issue of some kind, that you're better than others, that you're superior to, uh, than others. Keller <clears throat> points out very clearly that this is also the same problem with greed. He said, uh, <clears throat> come on in Al, he said um, in his 30-something years of being a pastor in New York City, he says, you know, I can't tell you the number of people that I've counseled over the years. And he said, and most of these are Wall Street people. And they've come to me with all kind of troubles, all kind of problems. But he said, in all of those 30-something years, I've never had one man come to me and say, Dr. Keller, I'm struggling with the love of money. I'm struggling with greed in my life. And he says, really, he says, what well, you, I think... I've come to realize is that people just don't see that the fact that I have this inordinate love of money. And then the third one is envy. It's envy. Now, I'm sharing this for this reason. Several years ago, I don't know if you remember, you may not, you may not read the blog that I put out, but I, I wrote about Charlie Munger. You know the name Charlie Munger, who died recently? I think he was 99. He was uh, uh, Warren Buffett's, he called him, they called each other partners. They were best friends. And Munger had a, a really good sense of humor, but he had a real wisdom about him. I think both of them do. And... Um, what a lot of people don't know is back in 1986, Munger gave the commencement address at Harvard. It may have been Harvard Law School, I, I don't remember. But the title of his commencement address was, How to Guarantee a Life of Misery. Don't you love that? How to Guarantee a Life of Misery. It was, I've read it, it's very good. <clears throat> but what I've just recently learned is where he got this idea from. And you won't believe this. He got it, the idea for this commencement, he got it from Johnny Carson. Because Carson, years before this, had given a commencement address at some school. 
And Munger had read it. And Carson said this. He said, I can't tell you graduates how to find a happy life, but I can tell you from personal experience how to guarantee misery in your life. And he said there are three prescriptions for misery. And he's drawing from this off of his own experience. He says the first is ingesting any kind of chemical in an effort to alter your mood or perception or just to feel better. And that can be obviously alcohol or drugs. He said second is, and we've already talked about this one, resentment and anger. Bitter indignation, he says, of being treated unfairly or poorly by someone in the past. And that that anger can eat you up. And the third prescription for for misery, he said, is envy. He said, I don't think people realize how envy can wreak havoc in their lives. Now, I read this somewhere and I'm embarrassed to tell you I can't give the proper credit to whose words these are because I don't know, but they're not mine. All right, I'll go ahead and make sure you know that. But I read this somewhere years ago about envy. Envy can ruin your life It can make you very unhealthy, and often you are not aware of what is making you so miserable. It was envy and jealousy that led to the crucifixion of Jesus. In Matthew 27, 1, it says, you know, Pilate had Jesus delivered over to be crucified. In in Matthew 27, 1, it says, for he knew that he had handed him over because of envy. In fact, the first murder recorded in the Bible was a result of Cain's envy and jealousy of his brother Abel. There is no emotion more basic to our nature than that of envy of another's gain. And by the way, envy, along with pride and greed, are one of the seven deadly sins identified by the early church. And and they're, and they're, they're connected. You'll see they really are all kind of connected. You could say they're kind of cousins. And we need to realize that so much of this arises from comparison. You know, I've I've said this before, if you you live on a desert island by yourself, you would never struggle with pride. You'd never compare yourself with someone. There's nobody for you to be above. And you wouldn't be envious of anybody. Nobody's around. And so otherwise, people are problems in our lives, particularly when we start comparing ourselves to them. So if you lived in isolation, you wouldn't be prideful, you probably wouldn't be envious, but you'd be mighty miserable because we were made <laughs> to be in relationship. We were, not, we were not designed to live in isolation from one another. Now I'm going to share with you two, maybe three illustrations that I want to share, I want to uh, leave with you. <clears throat> and then I'm going to stop. And I'll see if you have any comments or questions, all right? The first is an old fable that I thought was kind of cute, um, but it brings out the point about envy. It's about the devil was crossing over the Libyan desert, and he met a group of demons who were trying to tempt this holy, godly hermit a real man of God. And they were trying seductions of the flesh. And they were trying to cause him to doubt and then maybe be in fear of the future. But to no avail, he wasn't budging. They had no impact on him. And then the devil stepped forward and said, you guys, your methods are too crude. Permit me one moment. And he goes to the hermit who can't see him and whispered to him, Have you heard the news? Your brother has been made the bishop of Alexandria. And according to the fable, the scowl of malignant envy clouded the serene heart of this old man. 
And of course, the moral, of course, demonstrates the power of envy. Now, the second illustration comes from a really famous movie. It was a play on Broadway, <clears throat> and then it was a movie, and it won all kind of Academy Awards, including Best Picture. And some of you may have seen it, some of you may not, because it's been a while. It was called Amadeus. You may see that. It was about Mozart. But the real plot revolves around a guy by the name of Antonio Soleri. He was a court musician to the king of Austria in Vienna, and he encountered this teenage musical genius. His name was Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And Mozart was just incredibly blessed with talent. His, basically, his music was complex, moving, exciting, and reflected his total mastery of virtually all forms of composition. He was a genius. And it was clear that God had endowed him with extraordinary gifts. The problem with the young Mozart was he was immature, he was vulgar, he was obscene, and he was lascivious. He loved women. Now, Soleri, his contemporary who was older, had dedicated himself to serving God. In fact, he had promised God to write music that would glorify the Heavenly Father. And from his youth, he had dreamed of composing music that would lift the hearts of people heavenward. And he was committed to serving God and asked only that God might permit him to create the kind of music that would reflect the glory of God. The problem was that God had not endowed him with the same kind of talent that Mozart had. He was able to write these pleasant tunes, but no masterpieces. And he was very his music was very entertaining, but it would never immortalize the composer. And despite he had a certain degree of popularity, he knew deep down that he was just kind of a mediocre talent. And that his uninspired work would one day be forgotten. But the problem was that the envy that he had towards Mozart's gifts, and he violated God's laws of covetousness and envy. And he came possessed with envy, which led him to plot the destruction of Mozart. But what happens, and you see this in the, clearly in the movie, this obsession eventually drove him insane. And in the, in the uh, climactic monologue, Soleri curses God for denying him the kind of talent which he had granted Mozart. And so in this movie, you see this brilliant illustration of how envy can alienate a person from God and destroy his life. Now, <clears throat> um, I'm going to share this because I thought it was kind of interesting, and this may be true in some of you in your life, in your business. I don't know. But there was a guy here on Wednesday morning, and he was talk talking about the way envy can be used in businesses. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I work for a firm. And he's in the commercial, he's, he is a uh, financial, uh, not a financial planner, he's a financial, um, what, is he, what is it, Billy? What do you call yourself? A financial uh, advisor. That's the word I was looking for, sorry. He's a financial advisor. And he works for a large firm, large national firm. He said, you know what's interesting is, and I'm not sure what they pass out, and I'm not sure if it's weekly or monthly, but they pass out the results of, the, of, of, of who's, how much people have produced, and they have them ranked in order. Now, I don't know if they have the whole firm or just the top ten, 
But he says it's pretty obvious if you're not up there in the top ten, you ain't doing that good. And he says what they're trying to do is get you to the point where you're, <clears throat> you're envious of the people in front of you with the hopes that you're going to start performing better. I said, well, that reminds me, when I was in the insurance business, uh, one of our big competitors, they had a big thing on the wall ranking their producers from the very top to the very bottom. And I thought to myself, well, that's great and good, but what about the guys that are at the bottom? I mean, you know, what are you doing to them? I mean, you're shaming them. But the idea was envy drives people. And it will cause them to want to perform better. So you can see how this is an issue in life. And unfortunately, I think it's hard for all of us to detect it in ourselves. So guys, we envy others uh, because generally they have something in their lives that we don't. And so I guess you could say there's a jealousy an envy that arises. But also there's a problem, I want you to think about this, that people also want others to envy them. You see, part of our sin nature is we want others to envy us. People get great pleasure out of that. One of the most significant books written about this issue was written in 1899 by a man by the name of Thorsten Veblen. And the title of the book was The Theory of the Leisure Class. And I first learned of this book, you remember this, Mike? From uh, Dr. Murtaugh, who taught, who, who, who taught from this in our class, The History of Economic Thought. Mike and I were both uh, uh, economic uh, majors at Swanee. And he said Veblen, Veblen coined the term that probably fits the description of a lot of wealthy people in our land today. Have you ever heard of this term, conspicuous consumption? You know that term, conspicuous consumption? Think about what that is. Consumption is meaning you're buying, you're going out and buying something. But conspicuous is you want to be noticed for it. You want to be noticed for what you purchase. He says, he defined it this way, he says, when you buy something, conspicuous something, consumption is when you buy something and you do so not primarily because of its usefulness, but for the way it makes you look in the eyes of others. Listen to what Veblen said. He said this 125 years ago. He said, when people earn a surplus, they do not seek to employ it for useful purposes. They do not seek to expand their own lives to live more wisely, to live more intelligently, to live more generously, but instead to impress people with their money. And though we may not recognize it, what Veblen is saying is, guys, there's this psychological fulfillment which comes from being envied by others. But this is what we need to know. And we're going to talk about, by the way, how to deal with this in a minute. But this is what we need to know. This is very unhealthy. This is very harmful because of what it does to your heart and your soul, your innermost being, which is what we've been talking about. Because what we're trying to figure out is how to be a healthy man. So what do we do? What do we do about this? Well, first let me just say this. Um, if you want to really understand yourself, if you want to understand the desires of your heart, you need to try to figure out what you envy. Because it will tell you what your heart really loves and what it really longs for. Think about this verse. I know you're probably familiar with it. Matthew 6, 21. Jesus says, Wherever your treasure and riches lie, what? That's where your heart will be also. Think about that phrase. Wherever your treasure and riches lie. You know what Jesus is telling us, guys? That we all have treasures and riches in our, in our hearts. 
What are they? What do we treasure most in life? He says, whatever it is, it says, it will possess your heart. Now, hopefully, hopefully, what we treasure most are good things, like your marriage, your, your children. But think about that. Whatever you treasure in life, it's going to possess your heart. So what do we do about this, guys? What do we do about this? Well, if you would, turn in your Bible to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Now, this psalm, in fact, Psalm 73 to 83 is a psalm that's not written by David. It's written by Asaph. And Asaph was the leader of one of David's Levitical choirs. Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me... My feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Why? For I envied the arrogant. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, they had no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven. And their tongues take possession of the earth. Think about what this, guy, this is about. This is about a man who is envious of the wealthy. And one of the reasons he's envious is he says, because they are free from common human burdens. And in one sense, there, there, there's truth to that. Looking at a, po- a, a man in poverty versus a man who's wealthy. But then look at verse 11 and 12. They say, these wealthy people, they say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like, always free of care, and they keep on amassing wealth. In other words, these particular men, they're godless. But nevertheless, they live a very charmed life. Verse 13. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure, and I've washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. So what's he saying here? This is what envy can do for you, guys. He feels sorry for himself when he compares himself with these wealthy, godless men. He said, I've lived such a good life. Yet look at these other people who prospered, and I have not. And guys, I've seen this happen. I had a man who really struggled with depression because he grew up with a, with a bunch of men and his, who were his friends and they were all much wealthier than he was. And he was bitter and angry towards God. I mean, it, was, it led him to being depressed. But then, this is what's so remarkable about this one psalm. Something happens to him to completely shift his perspective. Look at verse 16. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed completely swept away by terrors. Asaph finally gets it. He he enters the actual sanctuary of God. He enters into God's presence. And it changes everything. 
You remember what we talked about two weeks ago? We talked about perspective. It's the lens through which you see life. And that your perspective can be rooted in what is true. Or your perspective in life can be rooted in what is false. And when he goes into the sanctuary of God, his perspective is transformed. He sees life now from God's perspective and not his personal fleshly perspective. And it changes everything. And you see a picture of this, guys. Let me just read this to you real quick if I can turn to it. I have a hard time with these pages in my Bible. But in Psalm... 63, let me read this to you real quick. This is, this is a picture of going into the sanctuary of God. This is Psalm 63. Um, it's verses 2 through 5. I have seen you in the sanctuary, and therefore held, beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name I will lift up my hands. And listen to this. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing my lips, my mouth will praise you. But he's talking about being in the sanctuary of God. He says, and I am fully satisfied satisfied my heart is fully satisfied this is a great question we need to ask ourselves guys is Christ a living reality in your life and my life and more and, and it almost is, is, is just as significant is your perspective rooted in biblical truth or do we find ourselves comparing ourselves to others and envying them? Because I, I'm convinced one of the enemy's most effective weapons is to turn some of life's greatest blessings into bitterness because of envy. But then if you look clearly in Psalm 73, and I'm going to read these, if you look at the last four verses, you see this major transformation has taken place in the life of this man. You see the, his unbelievable envy in the first nine verses. But look at verse 25. He says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you, they will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. And then I love this. But as for me, it is good to be near God. The New American Standard, if you have that, says, But as for me, the nearness of God is my ultimate good. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Now, as you read Psalm 73, you will notice that he has a certain perspective of life at the beginning of the psalm, and you see a completely different man at the end. And you know what's happened in one sense? This goes back to um, session two. You know what's happened to this man? He's gained wisdom. He sees life through the lens of truth. And so he's gained a wisdom about life. And we get a really good picture of this in the book of James. So I'm going to ask you to turn in the back of your Bibles to the book of James. And if you would go to James chapter 3. Now, I'm going to read to you 
a few verses from James 3, starting in verse 16, and you'll see James gives a description of worldly wisdom. Of worldly wisdom. He says, Who is wise and understanding among you? This is verse 13, James 3, 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly, it's unspiritual, it's demonic. For where you, listen to this, this is significant, guys. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder in every evil practice. He talks about worldly wisdom and worldly perspective and where it leads. But then, look at what he gives us in verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, it is pure. It is peace-loving, it's considerate, it's submissive, it's full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Guys, the wisdom of God brings great fruit into your life. But it also changes the way you see the world and the things of this world. <clears throat> and if you want to be wise, you need to go back and listen to session two where we spend a good bit of time on how does a man become wise. But you know what it really does? This is what strikes me. And this is really at the heart of where I want to go with this. Ultimately, guys, it helps us discern what has real value and worth and what does not. If you think back to Jesus' parable of the rich fool, Jesus speaks of this man who is a fool who tore down all of his barns and built back all these bigger barns. So he says, so my life, can, I, can get, I can be at ease, I can eat, drink, and be merry. That's what he, that, was his, that was the object of life for him. And Jesus said, you're a fool. He said, you're a fool, not because you have a lot of money, but because of your perspective. And he says, and because you are not rich towards God and the things of God's. You have not found the true riches of life. And so this morning as we wrap this up, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes left, I ask you to think about this. Are we rich in the things of God? Do we possess and greatly value the true riches of life? So please understand this, guys. Wisdom, remember, helps us to see what has great value and worth in life. And the Bible identifies these true riches. Paul refers to them sometimes as being, having great wealth or having great riches. And the scripture identifies at least four, maybe, there may be more, but identifies four things that have great value. And these four items of great value, if you want to call them that, you cannot attach a dollar value to them. In one sense, they're priceless. The first is this, and it's the greatest treasure we have, salvation by grace. It comes by grace. It's a gift, and you have to receive it. We're saved by grace through faith. And we know that's so valuable because of 2 Corinthians 8 9. One of our old memory verses. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though He was rich, but for your sake He became poor so that you through His poverty might become rich. That's the greatest asset we have in life. Now, the second thing he, Paul identifies as having great value, it's connected to the first, is that you now have a relationship with Christ. And you can know Him personally. And that's what Paul tells us in Philippians 
He talks about the unsurpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He says, I have lost everything. I've sacrificed everything. And everything that I sacrificed is garbage when you compare it with this incredible value of knowing Christ Jesus. Now the third, we'll just call it asset if you want to, this, this asset of great value is something that we all know. And we, I don't think anybody would disagree. One of the great treasures of life are your relationships with people. Think about all the, what the Bible says about having an excellent wife and the value of it. And the Bible talks about just the great value of your children and the relationship you have with them. It ta Proverbs talks a lot about friendship. In fact, Solomon says you can't be wise if you don't have good friends. And then the final treasure, and it probably shouldn't surprise you, is wisdom. Listen to what Solomon says about wisdom. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. She's more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Listen to this. And nothing you desire compares with her. Nothing we desire compares with wisdom. She is more precious than rubies. I've already read this. Nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. And if you remember when we talked about wisdom, we said that Solomon tells us that wisdom is like a personal bodyguard for us. Now, notice this, guys. None of these have a dollar amount attached to them. But this is what we need to realize. This is important. Salvation, the good news about salvation is it's a given. I don't have to pursue, pursue my salvation wondering if I got it. Once you become a Christian, and as Paul says, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and is sealed, then you are guaranteed eternal life. You're assured of it. That's the, you, I, yeah, people don't realize the importance of having that assurance. The worst thing that, that a person can, can be in a, a situation is, is wondering, have I, as they start thinking, have I been good enough? Am I going to get in? See, that's the beauty of salvation by grace through faith. It's a gift, you receive it, and you got it. You don't have to pursue it. But the other three, your relationship with Christ, your relationship with people, and wisdom, these are things that you can pursue all the days of your life. You can pursue to deepen your relationship with Christ, to deepen your relationship with your family and friends, and you can pursue wisdom all the days of your life because you'll never be perfectly wise. But we can always be pursuing this. And the more, we, and as we make progress, the better and healthier we are as men. And this is the one thing I hope we all grasp as we wrap this up. If we recognize these as the true riches of life and recognize that everything else is of less value and importance, you know what will happen? You'll be content with your life. You'll be content with your life. And you'll be content with who you are and what you have. Which will eliminate the comparison game which people play. And you know what will happen? The envy in your life will diminish and hopefully disappear. It's like the illustration that I've used before. Let's say next week when Mark Gentilette comes to teach, he says, guys, before we start, I'm going to show you the greatest card trick in the world. He pulls out a deck of cards. And he shows you this wonderful card trick. And we're all amazed over it. But the question is, would you envy him? Would you burn with envy that he can do it and you can't? I think the obvious answer is no. Now, if you were 12 years old, you might. 
but as an adult, you would not. And the reason you, would, you wouldn't envy him is because you're right, it's really not that important. Entertaining, but it's really not that significant. And that's why I'm reminded, and we'll close with this, the words of God to the wealthy people in Laodicea. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Here John is addressing this church in Laodicea, and it's a very wealthy church. And what I mean by that, there are a lot of wealthy people, and the church has a lot. And it's, it's very revealing what's said here. And in verse 17, which is where we're going to start, he talks about, really, he's talking about arrogance. See, the thing is, guys, I think some of the most dynamic people in life who make a huge difference in life are wealthy people who are humble and who are generous. The problem with the, the, the people at Laodicea, verse 17, you say to yourself, I'm rich. I've acquired great wealth, and I don't need a, a thing in life. But God says to him, but what you don't realize, in reality, you are wretched, you are pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. And then I love this. He says, but I counsel you. He doesn't say, and to hell with you. He doesn't say that. He says, let me counsel you. I counsel you. This is God talking. It's, this, is, this is red letters if you've got a red letter Bible. I counsel you. Come to me. Buy from me gold. He's not talking about literal gold. He's talking about the true riches of life. Buy from me gold refined in fire. You can become rich and get white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And I love this. And I'm going to give you salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Now, what he's talking about is he's saying this is a problem, is that this is what wealth can do to you. He says it can make you feel like, look, I don't need anything. I'm secure. I got all that I need. He says, but no, if that's your perspective, you're not wealthy. You're wretched. But come to me. Whether you have money or not, come to me. Come to me because I offer the true riches of life. And by when you have the true riches of life, I really believe that's when you become content with your life. And so that's my conclusion in this final session on being a healthy man. God is offering to us the true riches of life. And we have to pursue them. But it's important to recognize healthy men recognize this. They recognize the true riches of life and therefore are content with who they are and what they have.